thanks everybody for, for uh, coming on today. This is the um, last lecture ahead of the round table of the, of, of the autumn series. And as, as you know, we've dedicated the autumn series to uh, space health and our speakers today have been Nathan Bag Badcock and Vladko Vedral. Nathan's going to make the introduction to, to Vladko uh, in, a, in a little while. Um, so far, we've looked at astronaut health, uh, effects of space on mitochondria, and then looking at the physical uh, environment, microgravity, radiation, and magnetic effects on human health. And today we're going to be exploring quantum gravity and inertial stresses. Uh, and as I spoke with both Nathan and Vladko, a, a quite high component of physics in this, so we're going to be listening very carefully and intently. So at this point, what I'd like to do is introduce Nathan. Um, now, Nathan uh, is going to make the introduction uh, today and he's going to give a short, short talk uh, with a few slides initially. So Nathan, after defending his uh, doctoral thesis in Canada on quantum physics of biological electron transfer, held a number of postdoctoral research uh, positions internationally. Most recently, he completed a Guy Foundation postdoctoral fellowship position with the Quantum Laboratory Lab at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he continues to be actively involved uh, in research and training. Currently, Nathan is teaching at a local private academy in the U.S., where he leads the physical and life sciences education program. He also provides consulting expertise to Quantum Steam Lab, a pilot program that brings quantum mechanics to the primary and secondary school level in Philadelphia, with the goal of enabling uh, K-12 students to access career opportunities in quantum physics. Now, Nathan's primary research interest is in establishing the fundamentals of quantum biology. As such, he is now developing a modern graduate level text on the foundation of quantum biology, with a focus on the quantum mechanical principles that determine the structure and dynamics of biological systems. As an expert in quantum information science, structural biology and fundamental physics, we're really happy to welcome Nathan today to say a few words on quantum gravity and then introduce Professor Vladko Vedral. At that point, Nathan, uh, if I hand over to you and ask you to uh, share your slides. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, of course, a great honor for me to introduce Professor Vedral. Uh, his lecture today is quantum gravity, a cloud, on the physics horizon. And this is a question that resonates with me uh, because of course it goes back to uh, a talk that Lord Calvin gave at the beginning of the last century where he described how the uh, beauty and the clearness of the dynamical theory is that present obscured by two clouds. Now the uh, dispelling of those clouds led ultimately to the development of general relativity, the one pillar of physics that we have in modern physics today, and quantum physics on the other hand. The question of how these two things can be combined is uh, still an open question which we will investigate today. But before I go on, I should say a few words about our speaker. Uh, Professor Vidral uh, completed his education at the Mathematical Grammar School, a uh, world-renowned school in Serbia, before going on to do his uh, undergraduate and graduate work at Imperial College, London. He's held a number of appointments at uh, the University of Leeds as well, the University of Vienna, Primit Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, and the Oxford University and the National University of Singapore, uh, where he continues to contribute today to a vast array of areas of physics. Uh, one simply needs to look at his um, list of publications on Google Scholar, and uh, it seems he comes out with more and more every day. I uh, I'm delighted, of course, anytime I see a presentation uh, that harkens back to the history of physics, because my own belief is that by understanding where physics has come from, gives us the perspective, uh, the historical perspective to know where we're going. As Sir Isaac Newton said, uh, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. Uh, so with this idea in mind of uh, standing on the shoulders of giants and surveying the horizon of physics, we may see even today that there are some clouds obscuring our view. And particular, what is perhaps, you know, the most uh, obstruction, the most challenging thing to 
take in is the relationship between quantum mechanics and gravity, uh, because at a glance, they seem like very different fields. Gravity studies very large things, planets, nebula, galaxies, black holes in different parts of our universes. And of course, quantum mechanics is the study of things very small. Uh, but it's not fair to say they're unrelated. And in fact, there are certain assumptions of classical gravity um, that uh, are not compatible with the quantum system. And there's a rather famous paper from 1977, Epley and Hanna, who argued that if we are to try to combine uh, quantum mechanics with gravity uh, as it stands now, gravity being a continuous theory in the classical Aristotelian sense, and uh, quantum mechanics actually dating back to another Greek philosopher, Democrity, with the idea that the everything is, shall we say, atoms and void, discrete particles in the vacuum. But we can't keep these ideas completely separate. And in fact, if we try to combine the two, it's kind of like they crash into each other because, of course, uh, we have one theory that's continuous and the other theory that's completely discrete. So. This has been a highly controversial article since it was published in 1977 uh, because the very assumptions that they go into their argument are in contradiction with one another. We cannot have an infinitely small particle in quantum mechanics, uh, but of course in the continuum limit, dating back again to Aristotle, we have this idea that uh, continuum should be infinitely divisible that we can look deeper and deeper into it and never come to a smallest fundamental thing. But of course, the smallest fundamental thing is the whole idea of quantum physics. So we have this map of all of physics today and we have classical physics, you know, developed through the past centuries from Newton's, Newton's laws of motion through calculus and classical mechanics, fluid mechanics, chaos theory, electromagnetism, and thermodynamics, and the laws of Newtonian gravity, uh, which gave way to Einstein's special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity, which uh, treats all of space-time, that is the unified picture of space and time, not unlike Calvin's picture of a cosmic ether, the so-called fifth element, um, is uh, a medium which can be distorted, uh, if not a medium in the usual sense, like a, a fabric or a, a scaffold that you can imagine hanging things on. Einstein used to have pictures he would show of yardsticks and clocks in space ticking away, and you could imagine the yardsticks measuring the length and the clocks measuring the time uh, being distorted by the presence of matter in uh Again, this idea of a continuum that can be elastically deformed on the, with the presence of mass. This giving a sense, uh, just as if we're driving down the highway and we come to an embankment in the road that uh, allows us to turn a little more tightly. Uh, again, that actually the curvature of space-time causes things to move in a way that we would not usually think of as a straight line, but in fact becomes the shortest distance between two points in that curved space-time. Now, quantum physics has a completely different set of ideas. Uh, typically the metric, um, that is the technical term uh, for that kind of space-time arrangement, the imaginary surface on which we do our calculations, uh, the metric is generally assumed to be flat on a Hilbert space uh, where we have what's called an inner product and a lot of details that give us the structure of the atoms, material properties. And now if we apply this kind of quantization of the metric in quantum field theory, uh, we can get the creation and annihilation of particles, the kind of things you'd see in a particle reactor, nuclear physics. And of course, there's a lot of different ideas about how we go about combining these two. There's as shown on here, a kind of chasm of ignorance uh, and the hope for the future, we'll be able to combine the curved metric of relativity with the relatively flat picture of the inner product space in quantum mechanics. So what are we to do? 
what is quantum gravity? If you look to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, it simply says that quantum gravity broadly construed is a physical theory under construction that incorporates both the principles of general relativity and quantum theory. Uh, but it's easier said than done. And uh, I can tell you that simply reviewing the literature can feel like much more than going down a rabbit hole. It's like being sucked into a black hole. So much has been said and yet um, practically no predictions have been made. I mean, I shouldn't say that because, of course, we're having Vladko speak today uh, because he has pioneered the interest in actually developing a theory of quantum gravity that can make predictions that are testable using even present day technology. Conventional models of quantum gravity, which include uh, string theory, uh, canonical approaches, canonical quantum gravity uh, is canonical in the sense that it just uses the traditional or the historical approach to quantizing a system that is classical. And now we want to impose that kind of discrete structure of quantum mechanics on it. One result of the canonical quantization procedure as it applied to gravity is a loop quantum gravity, where they find that um, mathematical structures, solutions to the field equations that are called loops, actually give a tidy way of approaching the problem. Uh, but again, at the very, very small scale and the weak forces, relatively weak forces involved in gravity compared to very strong chemical forces that are involved in bonding and other you know, fundamental uh, chemical process that I teach my students in chemistry every day. Um, the issue being finding a general theory uh, that even has the kind of numbers going into it that we can imagine predicting in a laboratory. Now, some people have argued that perhaps um, the previous authors of the 1977 study were wrong and that we will find ways as we look deeper to combine the continuous classical picture of gravity um, you know, as the classical continuum with the discrete picture of quantum mechanics in a way that ultimately makes sense. And uh, certainly approaches like this have been taken in quantum mechanics, uh, imposing a discrete structure of the Hilbert space on the uh, space time, the actual space and time itself, and some kind called uh, a rigged Hilbert space, like rigging a ship to kind of go out into the sea, into the, you know, uh, uncharted unknowns. But so far, a few of these, if any, have really made any predictions because they focused on, you know, the very smallest scale, what's called the Planck scale, rather than actually saying, hey, what can we test? So this brings us to Professor Vidral's work, um, looking at his essential picture well, how do we test quantum physics? We have a, what's called an interferometer test. We can imagine a mass going into something like a beam splitter, a fork in the road where it can go one of two either way. And uh, now if it bounces off a mirror, if it's in a superposition of states, we can get an interference of the actual um, particles as they travel. Uh, the superposition states interfering with each other uh, to produce a result that differs if the particle can go through one path or the other versus the case where it literally is in a quantum superposition of both. When it's in a quantum superposition of both, like interference fringes, you would see in um, you know any number of interference experiments, or even if you're at the lake splashing or skipping stones in a pond, uh, you can see the two different waves from two different stones that hit the water interfere in a rippling pattern. So ultimately there's a way of testing for that rippling pattern if the particles interact in a way that actually um, has a superposition of massive particles interacting gravitationally. So in this case, if it obeys quantum mechanics, ultimately it always ends up with A. And if it doesn't obey quantum mechanics, well, it has a 50-50 chance of going either way when it hits the first beam splitter, the first fork in the road, and a 50-50 chance when it hits the second beam splitter, classically. So we would not see the kind of interference that prefers a single path. So this is a wonderful opportunity for a, a test. And it's exciting to think that these kind of uh, issues if the theoretical aspect of it is um, not making headway that we can simply, hey, do the experiment and find out what really is going on 
in gravity at the quantum level. Still, Feynman has emphasized that if we are to believe quantum mechanics, well, we're in a bit of trouble if we don't at least attempt to quantize gravitational theory. Now, the organizers of the talk has asked if I can say a few words about what this will mean in terms of inertial stresses, and particularly the question of biological processes. Our colleague Steve Thorne, of course, has uh, presented a number of ideas about the potential implications of gravity and inertial stress on biological processes. And so I can provide one simple example uh, looking at quantum spin, which is a uh, property of an electron, of a quantum particle, for example, that is often regarded as having no classical analog. Uh, and so it's a funny picture we present to the students when we say it's like a spinning top, but not really like a spinning top. And we have this kind of intuition, um, you know, that asks, is it really spinning or not? If it has angular momentum, then it seems that something ought to be spinning. But there's a problem that if we treat the electron as a rigid body, then the simple rigid body assumption, it would be spinning too fast. It would exceed even the speed of light. Uh, so this is sometimes taken as an indication that it's not spinning at all. But of course, the second assumption, the hidden assumption is that we've treated it as a rigid body. You don't need to be a rigid body to spin if we look at this cyclone or even uh, interesting cloud formations like the cloud formations that Lord Calvin has proposed obscuring the horizon of physics 100 years ago as it appears to do so today. And if you look into the actual relativistic, and I'm not talking about special relativity, which is sometimes discussed in terms of spin, but actually general relativity with what is called the energy momentum tensor. And in general relativity, the enter energy momentum tensor is a generalization of the classical concept of a stress tensor, the kind of shear and strain forces that engineers look at when they build bridges or construct that embankment on the road that we curve around. In fact, if you look at the energy momentum tensor in a naive way without the need to symmetrize it, a uh, special technique uh, that makes sure all the conservation laws essentially add up. Uh, it's a fundamental step that we need to do when constructing a quantum, or pardon me, just a gravitational model. If we don't do this step, we have no reason necessarily to add spin. But if we are careful to symmetrize the generalization of the stress tensor, the energy momentum tensor, which actually call, describes the deformation of space-time around a spinning electron, then we see in fact that even an electron with orbital angular momentum must have spin angular momentum in order to uh, preserve all the necessary conservation laws that translate from classical physics to gravity. So ultimately we have no fundamental, the universe doesn't necessarily know the difference between gravity and quantum mechanics. And in fact, we can see if we look deeply into the equations that finding this compatibility is something that we can look for. Now, there's a famous question in gravity, uh, the twin paradox, where we see two twin astronauts here, and one goes on a long space journey, the other one stays home, and the gravity uh, relativity predicts that the twin on the long space journey will come back as young as ever, while the twin who stayed home uh, has aged dramatically if it's been a long space flight. Now, this already introduces questions about oh, um, how gravity influences the flow of time, ultimately biological processes like aging. And the issue ultimately is the question if gravity and quantum mechanics are combined, you know, do the predictions of general relativity ultimately hold over? You know, is there a way to properly test the influence of gravitation on quantization effects like the electron spin? And uh, ultimately, can we predict the physiological processes in the astronaut using a combined form of gravitation and quantum mechanics? And will that truly actually, as we would expect, obey the predictions of gravity alone? Or is there a subtlety there that we've missed? Sometimes I feel like it's looking at the horizon from space. 
and that looking at these clouds, obscuring the horizons of physics can sometimes feel like staring into the eye of the storm. But you're not here to listen to me uh, meander on about these kind of questions. Uh, I would rather pass the lecture over to Professor Vidral, who has, I think, gazed more deeply even to the eye of the storm than I can possibly imagine. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief tour of the horizon of physics, the cloudy points, and the um, mysterious black spot at the center of the hurricane. Without further ado, Professor Vladko Vidral. Thanks very much for that um, really nice introduction. The wonderful uh, introduction to put things into uh, perspective, and I will try to um, uh, maintain that level um, uh, to make it really simple and uh, accessible. I'm, I'm really grateful to the uh, Guy Foundation uh, for this invitation and um, to be able to discuss issues that I think I'm very much interested in. Um, uh, Nathan already uh, explained really uh, nicely that uh, this is one of the potential um, clouds on the physics horizon, because um, if our uh, two theories, um, quantum physics and um, general relativity, basically they are sufficient to explain all the physical uh, phenomena that we have tested so far. If they are ever to, uh, to fail, uh, it's possible that they will fail at the intersection where both matter. And uh, actually, as you've seen from, from Nathan's nice introduction, this could um, happen um, in many situations, um, in the microscopic as well as the macroscopic domain. Uh, so there are many things to test, certainly many things we don't understand. But what's exciting, and that's what I want to get to um, at the end of this, is that we are technologically in a position uh, to test some of these um, ideas. And, and that seems to be hugely exciting to, uh, to a physicist like me, that, that we are not just going to be left at the level of speculations, but we can really um, try to... Um, at least disprove some of these uh, statements. So I'll give you a very brief um, intro um, into the key ideas uh, of quantum mechanics, and then I'll try to communicate um, why uh, as, uh, sometimes people think that something um, different might happen uh, with gravity. Possibly one of the biggest dissidents um, if, if that's the right word, is, is my colleague Roger Pemmons. And I think uh, if anyone uh, has been visible enough and vocal enough about collapse of quantum mechanics, it would be him. Um, um, I will completely disagree with that uh, in, this, um, uh, in this talk. And I think that's the exciting bit, that, that, that there is a great deal of um, disagreement. And that's precisely because um, the area is not understood, it's wide open, and, um, and there are many different um, theories to test it. Um, so quantum physics originally was really all about um, uniting um, the world of particles on which, I guess, um, the first proper theory of physics, Newtonian mechanics, um, is founded. Um, and then subsequently understanding uh, waves still within classical physics. Uh, of course, we owe it to people like um, Faraday and Maxwell. Um, Faraday introduced the idea of, uh, uh, of a field of something that's really wave-like, that's necessary to um, explain electromagnetism and light. That there's just one aspect of, of the whole thing. Um, and, um, and these two somehow uh, sat very uncomfortably with one another um, in the sense that um, it's, it's, clear that um, it's clear that both are correct in their own domain, uh, but conceptually they are very different uh, to one another. Um, the, the fundamental entities behave very differently. So Newtonian particles always exist um, 
uh, in one place at a given time, move at a well-defined uh, speed, and that's really all you need to know, the position and momentum of all of this to calculate anything you want. For waves, um, uh, as Nathan said, um, even water waves, of course, exhibit this phenomenon of interference, uh, that you get many waves coming together at a single point. You need to take them all into account, and they will somehow interfere to produce either something bigger than the sum of, of all of these waves or something smaller. They may cancel out. Um, quantum physics, um, from the very beginning, took both of these ideas on board um, and came up with a theory, in fact, that contains both of these aspects. Uh, that caused a lot of confusion in the early days of, uh, actually, it still causes a lot of confusion, but, but, uh, but I think some people should probably know better. But I think in the early days of, of quantum mechanics, um, there was a lot of debate about um, how can it be that uh, constituents, fundamental constituents of matter, as well as the chunks of energy, are both waves and particles at the same time. What does that even mean? Uh, and here I have this image which shows that, that they clearly look very different. On, on the left is, is this famous um, uh, cloud chamber where um, a that was the technology maybe that was relevant about 100 years ago or so, even more than that, actually, um, where people would wait for, um, for, a nuclear, for, for a nuclear decay of, an, of what they called an alpha particle, but it's really just the nucleus of the helium atom. So it has two uh, protons and two neutrons. It's clearly a particle according to the Newtonian uh, concept. However, um, as this particle propagates through um, a gas of molecules, every time it hits a molecule, it, it excites it, which um, basically creates a small cloud, a vapor. Um, and you can see this. Um, it's actually very easy to make this. I think you can make it in your kitchen these days in, in, in five minutes. In fact, you can watch a, a nice YouTube video how to make a cloud chamber. But it's clear that the image that you get uh, looks like straight trajectories that we traditionally associate with particles, just as Newton would say. If there is no other force acting on, on the particle, it will simply travel in a straight line. And these are just many different experiments um, where you basically take uh, pictures of this over an extended period of time. Each alpha particle goes in a effectively a random direction, and then you can see all of these paths. Now, on the, on the right-hand side, we have a picture of a wave. And the question for the early quantum mechanics was exactly why does the left-hand side, if we claim that the alpha particle should also behave quantum mechanically as a wave, why doesn't the image from the experiment look like the right-hand side picture? Why does, it, why, why does it look very Newtonian? And the first person to really um, explain this um, in great detail and properly, I think, was Mott. I think Darwin, um, funnily enough, Charles Darwin, but not the Charles Darwin, but his uh, grandson, uh, was a person whose writing I like a lot about, on, on this topic. And I think he started this explanation, which then um, was... Um, done in much more detail by Mott. Um, Heisenberg, as you will see, contributed to this, and certainly ultimately Schrodinger uh, also subscribed to this perspective. So, so here, is, here is what quantum physics suggests to us, um, that um, in fact, when the alpha particle comes out, this now goes to the core of quantum mechanics. It's, it's the key principle. It's called the superposition principle. Um, and the statement is as follows. When the, when the alpha particle decays, it really decays in all directions simultaneously. It takes all these paths at the same time. So it doesn't just take one trajectory, but it goes into a superposition of all possible trajectories. However, when 
it hits along one of these trajectories, a molecule in a particular direction, that acts almost like a measurement. Because now you can say, oh, it's going in this specific direction. And then you can calculate that quantum mechanics will tell you that the probability is almost 100% for the alpha particle to continue in exactly the same direction. So, so the next molecule that will be excited lies exactly on the straight line. So it's quite, quite miraculous that actually by following a wave picture that quantum mechanics suggests to us, and it really is all about quantum waves, um, you will, you can get a picture of a particle through a kind of interaction with the environment, in this case, the gas, and ultimately, of course, the interaction with the camera or with the, with the, with the experimental physicist who is doing that experiment. But, but the astonishing thing is that you really do have to acknowledge that the alpha particle goes in all directions at the same time. Um, and, and as you know, later, this was um, um, very colorfully um, almost brought, brought to a paradox, so to speak. It's just that it's not paradox as far as we can see, experimentally speaking, by Schrodinger, who said, wait a second, if you think that the alpha particle goes in all possible directions simultaneously, then when you observe the alpha particle, and if you yourself think that you are a quantum object, Schrodinger had this famous cat, but I think we can we can up it even more and talk about human observers, if you like. What this suggests is that for each trajectory, there is a different observer that gets entangled to this. So this is the fully quantum picture. And I'm telling you this simply because initially, Schrodinger thought this sounds very paradoxical because it seems now that every time anything gets coupled to this kind of quantum superposition, it actually joins the superposition and becomes part of this superposition. Schrodinger called this entanglement. That's the, that's the famous word. And Schrodinger said, this is the key effect. That's really the effect that discriminates any, um, any classical physics, any wave, classical wave physics, Newtonian physics, even general relativity, even gravity is according to this classical theory. It doesn't exhibit these kind of things. But quantum mechanics has it there in the very foundation. And in fact, everything as far as we know can be in these entangled states. We've tested this with, you know, particles of light, with photons, with simple um, atoms, um, nuclei, uh, even subatomic particles, subnuclear, and so on, going up to more and more complex molecules. And we know that even complex molecules that maybe have um, 10,000 atomic units, which is quite big for, for, for a physicist, um, um, can actually interfere. If you, if you shoot them through a bunch of slits, then they will literally go through all of these slits at the same time. Uh, of course, we don't know whether there is a scale at which this behavior stops, but it's clear to us that it's starting to go very slowly into the macroscopic domain. And of course, gravity, as we know, um, is relevant exactly, um, uh, at least it's, it's obviously relevant in the macroscopic domain. And therefore, a, a very natural question arises, how do the two uh, combine together? So let me let me distill the, the the key messages from quantum mechanics, and then I will um, and then I will talk about this problem of quantum gravity. So according to Schrödinger, and not just according to Schrödinger, but but many other people, uh, and, and this is what I think is one of the main messages as well of quantum mechanics is that measurement. There's nothing special about quantum measurements. Um, it simply tells you that the measurement apparatus, which is one quantum system, becomes quantum entangled to another quantum system. So much as, much as the example that I gave, where, when an observer looks at the alpha particle, it will see one trajectory that the alpha particle takes. But quantum mechanics says 
all of the other trajectories exist. It's just that they are correlated, they're entangled in the Schrodinger language to other observers. And this is something we can test. Uh, at least up to, like I said, a certain degree of complexity. We can't test this with human beings yet, but um, people like me hope that even uh, these kind of superpositions must be tested uh, or might be testable one day. Different topic, and we can discuss it um, if, if there is an interest. So I like this fact that quantum mechanics doesn't just unify particles and waves and everything becomes the same kind of entity that's capable of superposition entanglement but it applies to observers as well it says there's nothing special about observers they're simply other physical systems and any kind of entanglement between any kind of two or more physical systems effectively constitutes a measurement according it's very democratic in the sense that much as a human observes the alpha particle in that experiment, you can equally say that the alpha particle observes the human being. Of course, the alpha particle is probably not conscious unless you are a, a panpsychist. However, the fact that the correlation has been established and to each trajectory of alpha particle corresponds a different state of the measurement apparatus is, is certainly un, undeniable in quantum mechanics. And this is a beautiful picture because it's very different to, to what you frequently read about uh, quantum mechanics in the popular press, uh, that, that you know there are collapses, um, when you make a measurement, you influence reality, you change the world and all of these things. None of that is really true, I think. And, and that's probably um, probably um, uh, clearer now than certainly in the early days of quantum mechanics, simply because we've tested it in all sorts of different domains. Schrodinger, particularly in his um, um, lectures in the 50s, early 50s, um, emphasized this very much. He disliked um, any collapse. He disliked discontinuities. He didn't like quantum jumps. I think there was a famous statement where he says, if quantum jumps turn out to be real, then I, I should have been a plumber, not a, not a physicist, and, and so on. No spooky action at the distance either, by the way, which is, which is interesting, despite entanglement, which is real. Uh, now, how there's one one further thing I want to add to this, and then we'll be ready for the punchline, if you like, actually. And, 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 uh, um, and, 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 and it's this input from Heisenberg. How did Heisenberg think about all of this? Heisenberg was the first person to write down um, the initial laws of quantum mechanics. He, he was the guy responsible for the initial breakthrough. It's an ingenious paper. Um, no one understands it. There are, there are books written about how, how he did it. Um, it's, it's written almost in a magical way, completely using intuition. Uh, very little um, uh, watertight, 100% logical reason. It's a paper that exemplifies beautifully the difference between physics and mathematics uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very transparent manner. Um, here is what Heisenberg said. Maybe this is one. Of, this is one of the rare equations I will have. But as I said, we all learn it in high school. I think we can all handle it. Heisenberg said something. Something really clever. In fact, I'm quoting Dirac, who realized what it is that Heisenberg was doing. I don't think Heisenberg quite realized it like this. But that's because he was breaking through. He he was literally inventing a new language and a new theory. Or discovery. So basically, he would say, uh, what we need to do is only one thing to get from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. We don't need to change the classical laws at all. And, and this sounds this sounds magical. So he says Newton is okay. Maxwell's equations to describe fields perfectly fine. Don't change that. So what should we change? Um, and, and here is a, a, very, a very simple way of understanding what we should change. And, and that's the extra ingredient I think we need to have. And once we have that, we can 
more or less understand the whole of quantum mechanics and then see how to try to apply it to, to gravity. So Heisenberg said, think about just a, a free particle in Newtonian physics moving um, in time without any forces being present. So, you know, this is the, the first law, if you like, of Newton's. And it simply says, I think we all know that, that the position x at some time t will be equal to the initial position, whatever it is. I could have chosen it to be zero, if you like. Initial position of your particle plus the speed of that particle times time. That's it. So that's basically a straight line um, uh, if you plot position against time, it will be a straight line where the velocity is the gradient and the velocity doesn't change in time because there are no forces by assumption acting on this particle. It's a straight line. It's just that, as I was telling you, in quantum mechanics, it's not a straight line. It's more like a wave. It goes in all directions simultaneously. So how do we get to that? And here is the ingenious idea of Heisenberg's. He says, don't think of x, don't think of the position and the velocity as numbers. Don't think of the, don't think of the, the particle is sitting five meters away from the lamppost and it's moving at five meters per second. This is how a, a classical uh, Newtonian mechanic would actually say this. Heisenberg had the idea that these quantities are not just real numbers, but they are what Dirac called Q numbers, quantum numbers. They are operators if you're a mathematician. And the key, the key, they are matrices if you choose to represent them as a matrix. Not just a single number, but they are arrays of numbers, many numbers at the same time. You can see where the superposition comes in through this idea. And here is what Heisenberg says. If you multiply position at one time, time t, with the position at the initial time zero, that's not going to be equal to if you multiply them the other way around. This is the famous Heisenberg's uncertainty. And it applies to different positions. It applies to positions and speeds or momenta, as we like to call them, and so on. So Heisenberg said, think of the law being still the same law, but the entities that you put inside, instead of these x's and v's, are no longer just numbers. They are basically these more generic entities that don't commute in the language of a mathematician. So that means you have to be careful how you multiply them, in which order. And the next line is simply that bracket, which is called the commutator, which tells you that the difference between the two orders, xt times x0 minus x0 times xt, in fact, is not equal to zero. For Newton, this would be equal to zero, of course, because five times six is equal to six times five. There is no question about it. They commute. But for Heisenberg, the realization was that what we should be doing is acknowledging that there are more general entities than just numbers. They are Q numbers, not C numbers, not classical numbers, as Dirac would call them, but quantum numbers. And that's all there is to it. It's a beautiful idea because it says, don't modify the laws of dynamics, but upgrade the quantities inside this. Uh, you can see that this requires a lot of ingenuity, a lot of guesswork and intuition. And actually what this gets you, and I don't want to really bore you with the details of this, it gets you to acknowledge that the trajectory of the particle now shouldn't be thought of as a straight line but it should be thought of as something that spreads as the particle propagates, much as a wave would spread, any kind of wave would spread due to its dynamics. So that, that's the amazing thing. And now Heisenberg says, let me go back to the, to the alpha particle experiment. So the alpha particle starts here, and as it spreads, if the gas 
is dense enough so you can test this actually by, by changing the density of the gas. If the gas is dense enough, it will soon encounter the first molecule. And that molecule, by entangling itself to the particle, will act like a measurement. Now, suddenly, you know that the particle cannot be in a, in a region larger than that molecule. And then the next step comes in. According to quantum mechanics, it again wants to spread. But now it hits the next molecule. And this next molecule localizes the particle, and so on, and so on. So basically, out of this wave-like behavior, but quantum with Q numbers, quantum wave-like behavior, you can, in fact, derive through a sequence of these collisions with molecules, sequence of entanglements in the Schrodinger's uh, jargon, you can actually derive the straight line classical Newtonian trajectory. This, this is a mind-blowing picture. Everything works like this in our universe. E everything. It, it just, just apply this. If you think that thinking, if you think that our consciousness, our everything we do inside the brain is based on the dynamics of atoms and molecules, then it's exactly how the thinking works as well. That it starts in many different, this is kind of, this is, uh, this is the level to which I would like neuroscience to get to in terms of the sophistication of experiments so that we can start to ask similar questions in that domain. And I think we will find quantum effects um, at small enough scales in fast enough times. But that's a different topic. But, but I think this applies to everything as far as we are concerned. So here it is. And I think... Um, Basically, I think with this slide, we will have enough information that I can tell you the, the key issues with quantum gravity. And then I will leave it at that, I think, because, um, because probably we just have to wait for the, for the experiments to tell us uh, which way to go. So the, the first three points are the points I already said come from um, the Mott uh, and Schrodinger logic. Um, but the fourth ingredient now says fundamental elements of reality are these weird quantum numbers. They are not real numbers. Don't think of reality as, as having real numbers attached to every point in space and every instant in time, as Newton would have it, or as Faraday and Maxwell would have it, or as Einstein would have had it as well. But think about these numbers as these more generalized numbers where you have to be careful how you multiply them. You have to keep, preserve the order in which you multiply them. And all of the quantum effects are simply a consequence of this thing. Quantum superposition, of course, is written into this kind of, into this logic. Uh, why am I emphasizing this? Because if you open a random newspaper, um, you will read something along the following lines, especially last year when there was the Nobel Prize given to people who confirmed entanglement beyond reasonable doubt, at least with the particles of light, with photons. You will read a typical headline saying, physicists prove that there is no reality. Uh, I think you should just bin these kind of uh, articles and newspapers because Physicists can never prove anything like that. That's that's obvious. Uh, what physicists can prove is the that a, a well-defined specific form of reality doesn't simply conform to the experiments. But that doesn't mean there is no reality. It just means there is a different kind of reality to the prejudice that you had based on whatever classical physics uh, you know. So there is certainly a reality. Reality is independent of us. It's sitting out there. It's behaving in, in the way it wants to behave. And the jump we have to make to understand all of these quantum effects is that the, 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 the data we need to understand the reality Newton would say, just give me all the positions and give me all the momenta. And I can calculate that. That's the famous Laplace demon. I can calculate anything that's going to happen. 
Well, here, it's the same logic, but the data are not given to you as numbers, but as quantum numbers. And, and the rest works exactly the same way. It's, it's just as solid, as mathematical, as logical, as rigorous as any other physics. I, I think I think if this wasn't the case, then then I certainly would have wished to be a, a carpenter or whatever else, right? So it's one of those. Certainly all physicists subscribe to a real, not not the classical real, but some kind. Reality. Otherwise, what's the point? Right? Um, so now I'm I'm uh, very close to, in fact, telling you about about the key aspects, and and I think then I'm happy to stop and maybe answer questions and so on. Um, I'm not going to keep you too long. So this this was the direction from which the Iraq came. Remember, I said that he introduced this concept of a Q number, that it's all about don't change the equations, don't change dynamics. It's the same dynamics, but upgrade certain quantities within your equations to these kind of Q numbers. Now you can see that uh, what Dirac was influenced by uh, is by a similar idea that he learned from someone. I think this was an undergraduate set of lectures he attended um, uh, at Cambridge. Uh, where someone explained that the normal, what we call Euclidean geometry, is violated if if we don't base it on ordinary real numbers, but we base it on numbers that do not commute, exactly like the Q numbers. So I think this kind of idea was key. It came from geometry. And what you happen to violate in Euclidean geometry, if you change the real numbers into into these more generic numbers, is is you, you violate many things actually. But the one that that I think we are all familiar with is that if you have if you have two parallel lines, um, they will never intersect. Sometimes it's related to the fifth postulate of, of Euclid and things like that. However, you can see. Here in quantum mechanics, if you acknowledge that a particle, a free particle, should actually classically describe a, 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 a line, a straight line, if you take two particles that, that go at the same speed but start from different positions, they will literally never meet. They will go in parallel to one another. However, quantum mechanically, because um, the logic is this quantum logic, the, the quantum uh, numbers rather than classical numbers. Each of these particles will actually spread as it propagates. And definitely, if you put, I'm, I'm here, it's a very simple drawing of two alpha particles now decaying. Each of them propagates to free space. And if you put a detector somewhere in the middle, you will definitely, every once in a while, get two clicks. Both particles will be detectable in the region in between. And that clearly violates um, the classical intuition that two straight lines, two parallel straight lines should never meet. Um, and and now, now the punchline, which is true for all the physics that we do, and the question is, is it true for gravity? That's the point. It's true for all the other forces. I think this picture already gives you um, gives you a, a nice way of visualizing. What we are now going to put on top of this is interactions between particles. So, so far I talked about free particles, but what if these two particles are charged particles? Think about two electrons. They are not neutral, they are charged. And now they behave in this very weird quantum mechanical way. They actually exist in a superposition of many different classical motions, if you like, if you like that kind of analogy. How, how should they now interact through the er electromagnetic field? So two like charges tend to um, repel one another. So they will feel a force between each other. And of course, that force is explained uh, through this Faraday idea that there is a field in between which communicates which, between these particles. But the, feet, but the force depends on the distance, as you remember. The force between particles depends on how far apart they are 
it goes as one over the distance squared. And in quantum mechanics, you immediately encounter the following problem. Which distance should I now take between these different particles? There are many distances because each particle is in a superposition of different trajectories. There is a, a very large distance between the endpoints. The, the, in, in some regions, they are almost uh, next to one another. They, in fact, have a chance of intersecting. As I said, you can detect them in the same place at the same time, which means the, the force is much stronger. They are very close to one another. The question is, how does quantum mechanics now decide which, which of these should I take as the distance? And, and as always in quantum mechanics, the answer is take all of them. Take them in a superposition. Everything that exists in the quantum domain always exists at the same time. Um, and we know that this is true, like I said, for all the three forces as far as we've done experiments. But what we don't know, and that goes to the basically to the core of this question, is would gravity behave in exactly the same way? So if you were to take two objects that have mass, um, in, in fact, according to Einstein, anything that has energy gravitates. So even two laser beams will be gravitationally attracting one another. The, the gravity is very weak there. You, we can't really test it um, properly, at least not with the present technology. But if you take two large enough massive objects, then you can ask, is gravity that mediates the force between these two objects, does it really exist in many different states at the same time? Is it in a superposition of states? And I think Nathan showed a nice picture from a paper that um, Chiara Maletto and myself wrote for Nature. And we wrote a, a little bit more detailed follow-up for, for physical review letters, where we actually said that this is the idea that should be that should be tested. So here is a very brief, and I will jump to the um, to some of these experimental issues, and then I, I think I can um, I can stop there, and 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 uh, we can discuss. And I have more slides if, if anyone is interested in uh, more details. But basically, this simply summarizes this idea that if all the constituents, um, any particle can really be in many different states at the same time, then when these particles interact, whatever mediates the interaction, whether it's the electromagnetic force, the strong, the weak force, or gravity, is, is my claim here, it ought to understand what it means to be in a superposition, and it ought to respond in exactly the same way. So all of these experiments are very much like either the alpha particle or Schrodinger's cat, whatever it is that you like to have in mind as as a kind of as as the best example of the uh, of the quantum behavior. And the question for us, of course, and that's the crucial question: Is this the whole story as far as gravity and quantization is concerned? And we are very far from answering this uh, question. So the question we are asking now is, even at the simplest level, at the level of very basic interactions that Newton was describing, even in the classical, uh, in a pre-relativistic gravity, would gravity understand what it means to put a mass in a superposition of different um, states? And I think, again, I'm betting that the answer is yes. Uh, there are other people who are betting that the answer is no. Um, and even in the no camp and the yes camp, there are all sorts of sub-religions, so to speak, where people are betting on different yeses and different noes, that it would be a yes for a different reason or a no for a different reason. So it's a very vibrant direction. So just to tell you, just to show you very briefly where we are, and this is this famous physics cube, where we have um, three important fundamental constants, the gravitational, the Newtonian constant G, speed of light, C, and H-bar telling us about quantum mechanics. 
Um, what we would, of course, like to to ultimately be able to do is is experiment in this corner here, the closest to us. That's called the theory of everything. So that's the theory where speed of light matters, gravity matters. So it's special and general relativistic, if you like that language, as well as quantum mechanics. But we're very far from that. What I'm proposing now is that the first bit that we will be able to test, and it hasn't been tested at all, is this vertex here, where I called it non-relativistic quantum gravity. Non-relativistic meaning that nothing has to move very quickly. The masses I have in mind can be stationary. In fact, they don't have to travel at high speeds. However, even in that domain, gravity and quantum mechanics might matter simultaneously. So, so we are kind of just about approaching this vertex. We, we tested special relativity on its own really well, general relativity on its own really well. Quantum mechanics, each of these axes has been tested reasonably well in physics, and now we are moving closer to combining them. And I think we are kind of now approaching this vertex at the back, non-relativistic. But we are a long, long way away, possibly, from the theory of everything. And if we get lucky, as Nathan said, or as, as Lord Kelvin said, maybe this will turn out to be a cloud. Maybe we are going to get different prediction, different results from the predictions we are making, and that would be fantastic. For, for all of us, really, it would tell us a new bit of information about fundamental physics that we haven't had for more than 100 years. Both quantum and general relativity have been depressingly successful. Um, and, and that's kind of where we are um, at the moment. So Nathan already indicated some of these things, which I don't want to really go in, in great detail about. But... Uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that there have been many people who said even, and I think Nathan presented one article, there are many other physicists who have made the statement that we will never be able to test quantum nature of gravity. Uh, and it's based on a very um, heuristic argument that I think Nathan mentioned, that gravity is so weak that we are never going to be able, for instance, to detect a particle of gravity, graviton. Um, unlike photons, which we can detect very nicely, we can map out the photonic field, no problem, the, the quantum electromagnetic field. In gravity, you can actually do a very a kind of back of an envelope calculation to show you that if you excite an atom, it will take infinity, more or less, for this atom to decay and give you a graviton. So, so better don't try to, um, to build uh, graviton detectors like photo detectors, don't try that analog because it's never going to work. You're going to be waiting longer than the age of the universe. Uh, but but the beauty of, of what I was saying about um, entanglement before is that you don't need to do that. You can actually have evidence for the quantum nature of gravity um, in a reasonably laboratory-like setting. You don't have to go to strongly gravitating objects like black holes or anything like it's an experiment that can be done in the lab and in fact uh, there are many groups that are now really trying to attempt that but the, but the main obstacle is that gravity is orders and orders of magnitude in, in this calculation here it's 43 orders of magnitude weaker than the electromagnetic force and that's our problem that's really what we are uh, up against so we're trying to make things exist in, a, in many different states, which is more likely when, when the object is small. But at the same time, we want it to be large enough to be relevant gravitation that we can even detect the effects of gravity. And I don't want to go to, to, to many of these uh, possibilities here. But one thing that, um, that people, maybe this is one um, one concept from gravity that I think people usually think will be in conflict with quantum mechanics, and I just want to tell you what the prediction of um, of mine would be, or, or people who are thinking along similar lines that gravity surely ought to be quantum mechanical at this level. So this is a famous principle that Einstein realized that called the equivalence principle, 
that you can't discriminate between acceleration and gravity. You know, he called this the happiest thought of his life. And the thought was this. Um, if you are in a lift and you are, you know, and the lift detaches um, and you are freely falling down. By the way, we know this from many space travel movies that we've seen now, even if we haven't experienced it ourselves, that free fall is actually very much like the Newtonian inertial frame of reference. In a free fall, you don't feel any force at all. Things exist as though there is no force around you. Of course, you will feel a very strong force when you hit the ground, uh, but, but that's the electromagnetic force, not gravity. But while you are freely falling, um, any kind of test that you can do in your vicinity would just say there are no forces acting on anything. Everything behaves as though there are no forces around. Another way of putting this, if someone was accelerating your lift, you'd be, you'd be stuck to what, you know, if, if someone was accelerating it from the bottom, you'd be stuck down to the bottom, almost as though you were attracted by gravity. Even if there was no gravity present, all you had are rocket engines that were strongly accelerating the lift. You'd be stuck to the bottom of the of the of the of the cabin just as 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 if you were basically sitting on a massive object. And that's what the equivalence principle says. Now why do some people, and I think again, Roger Penrose is the most prominent person who would say that quantum mechanics violates the equivalence principle. Uh, and the, I, I think that's a correct statement, but what it violates is the classical equivalence principle. Um, and that's always the case with quantum mechanics. You need to upgrade the equivalence principle to, to basically include um, quantum mechanics to this. Let me just show you this slide to see what I what I have in mind. If you have a massive object and you put a test object uh, close to it, it will start to accelerate towards it, as we all know, just from basic Newtonian physics. The question now for a quantum person is if I put an object in a superposition, if it's in two places at the same time, and now I have a test particle, which way is this particle going to go? And a classical person, someone who believes that classical gravity will prevail, would say something like this. It will either go one way or the other. It will either be attracted, according to the equivalence principle, towards this mass here located or towards the other mass. And this obviously violates quantum mechanics. If this is what you mean by the equivalence principle, then it's definitely uh, in opposition to the superposition principle of quantum mechanics. However, what I think will happen here is that this test particle accelerates in two different directions simultaneously. It starts to basically spread and starts to exist in a superposition of different trajectories, much as what I was saying about the alpha particle or any other quantum object that we've tested. So that's a clear prediction there. And in fact, the, uh, the, the experiment that Nathan described, and I will get to it now to conclude, is literally testing this kind of idea. If I have a mass in a superposition and another mass in a superposition, what does this really mean? as far as gravity is concerned. Um, and I will, I will um, let me get to that because I can simply show it with an image rather than showing you um, the, the slides that, uh, that give you all of these references. So here is a very simple image, slightly different. This is a top down, so to speak, slightly different from the, uh, this is only from physical review letters. I think Nathan showed you a nature paper and they usually have uh, fancier pictures. That's almost a, a way of upgrading your paper from PRL to nature. To have these pictures. However, um, joking aside, yeah. um, you have a mass, um, two masses that are the same, if you like, even. They weigh the same. Um, you put one mass through, 
through an interferometer, which means you really create a superposition of this mass. You let it exist like that for a certain period of time. Time goes, let's say, from left to right on this picture. And then uh, you do that with two masses simultaneous. And the key idea you are testing is that when each, when the top mass exists in two different locations at the same time, and the bottom mass also exists in two different locations, how should I understand the law of gravity that tells me that gravity goes as one over R squared, R being the distance? Which distance should I take now? And quantum mechanics says take all of them, include all of them simultaneously. Gravity, in other words, ought to get entangled to these masses. That's the prediction of, of quantum gravity, even at the level where you can test this. So basically, here is one distance. Here is, you know, D1 and D2 distances, as I call them. And if you include all of these effects, the interesting thing is that you can find a regime where these two masses become quantum entangled. And that's why what we believe is, is that witnessing, measuring this kind of entanglement between massive objects would be a crucial evidence for the quantum nature of gravity. You simply could not explain it in any other way. If gravity didn't transmit quantum mechanically, if there was any return to classical physics, to classical numbers and so on, none of this would actually um, ever work. And if you put in some numbers, um, I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to bore you too much with, uh, with some of these things. If you put in some numbers, just to give you an idea, um, is that the masses you need are still much larger uh, than the ones that we've been able to quantum mechanically superpose and interfere. So there are probably a few orders of magnitude larger than the molecules I said people were diffracting, but we are getting there. So here I chose um, I chose a pico uh, or nanogram mass, a pico kilogram, if you like, nanogram mass. And the extent of the superposition that we require is about a micron, which is dual. So these, these superpositions, the masses should exist one micron apart from each other. And the time over which this has to um, be kept is about a microsecond. So it gives you roughly the regime in which you have to be in order to be able to entangle two masses, quantum entangle two masses only through the gravitational field, no other field present. And that's very interesting. So what you're testing really is whether gravity has the full features, even at this simple Newtonian level, whether it has full features of superpositions, entanglement, and whether it's underpinned by what, like I said, there are called Q numbers. That's really the gist of it. I don't want to, like I already indicated, there are predictions which would disagree with this. I know when I, when I talked to Roger, and I think we regularly discuss this, um, he would certainly say that this, this would not end up in an entangled state. So there is a clear, here there is, and that's the beauty of physics, that we can always, we can afford to think about simple enough situations where we can make definitive predictions and then you can have people agree uh, or disagree. So there are various versions of gravity that would be refuted by this. And there are various versions of gravity that would be confirmed, but we wouldn't necessarily know uh, how to discriminate them from this uh, test only. So I don't want to, I don't want to go too much into any other questions because simply they may, may come up. And I think what I've already mentioned is, is, um, is quite a lot. L let, me, let me just go to conclusions to summarize the main message. So it seems to me, at least at the level that I've been talking, um, that gravity is understood by general relativity is not a priori, is no more incompatible with quantum mechanics than any other field. And to me, that's interesting because Nathan already indicated that many people have written many papers that these two theories are completely incompatible and so on. I, I fail to see this. And in fact, when you examine each of them in a bit more detail, I, I don't think uh, that this kind of view can be substantiated. Um, like I said, something may well fail, 
nature doesn't have to follow our logic that's based on, on these two theories. And that would certainly be interesting to, to know. But it seems to me that that need not be the case. That's certainly a possible outcome. The key thing to, to conclude this is really that you should upgrade all of these relevant entities to Q quantum numbers. So even the gravitational field itself now becomes, um, I think Nathan mentioned the, the metric, which is the key entity in uh, the, 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 it's an object that tells you about distances in space and time. This object would now no longer be telling you simply about classical numbers, real numbers as distances, but would have to be upgraded to this kind of quantum number. And there are many ways how to do that, and this can all be uh, tested. And so that's really the, 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 main, uh, the, the main message. That at the, even at the level of our current technology in the lab, not necessarily in space uh, or close to very strongly gravitating objects, it seems to me we can actually uh, test this. Um, the next order effect, uh, which also could be tested under some circumstances, is then, of course, a big question. What happens then? Would quantum mechanics still prevail and so on? Uh, it seems to me, yes. It seems to me that there is a certain internal logic. But, of course, the higher up you go in this hierarchy, the smaller these effects are. And the question is, uh, are they really observable? Will they ever be observable? And so on. And, and the final point I'm making is exactly along these lines. That what we desperately need is really experiments in any of these directions to really tell us whether we're doing something wrong and at least to inform us uh, partially what we should be doing. Um, thank you very much for your attention.